Next case to come before the court is Megan Vitek. Is that correct? Vitek? Yes. Okay. The Brian Ward. Um, each party will have 15 minutes to present their arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you so desire to do that, please let me know if I'm keeping track of the time. The arguments are being recorded, so please stay behind the podium and keep your voices up. Uh, introduce yourselves. You should not use the names of children, minors, or victims during your arguments. You can refer to folks should that be um, uh, relevant here by their initials. Uh, the judges have read your brief and are ready to proceed when you are. And I would ask the appellant uh, counsel, would you like to reserve the bottle time? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. I'd like to reserve the five minutes. Okay, and uh, the court apologizes, but the um, the clock on the wall is not particularly working to give you a notification if you're running into that rebuttal time, but I will certainly let you know. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, are you ready? You may proceed when you are ready. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Attorney Danielle Kulik, and I represent the appellant, Staff Sergeant Brian Ward. I am joined here today with my law clerk, Isabella Nigel, who's seated just there. And I want to address first what I think was kind of an, the elephant in the room. Uh, none of the three of you, I believe, were on the original oral argument. But one of the issues, this case was remanded to decide whether or not the judgment entry was void. And one of the issues that came up last time was the fact that I kept referring to my client as staff sergeant. That might be small to you. It's kept me up for two years, <laughs> personally. Um, Memorial Day was yesterday. I couldn't sleep. I am going to refer to him as Staff Sergeant Brian Ward. That is his name. That is his title. And last time I was here, the question was, where was that in the pleadings? Where was that in the record? And I think that's relevant to today. It wasn't. And the reason it wasn't is because my client was never served. My client was never served a copy of the complaint for divorce. My client never appeared in the court. My client was never served a court order he was to obey. Uh, Attorney McGarter did try to serve my client with a motion for contempt of court for not following a court order he never had. Uh, he did get service of that the day before the hearing. I did put this in my briefs. The notice that my client received, the only notice my client ever received in this case, was this fill-in-the-blank form, summons an order to appear for contempt of court on May 16th. That's the only thing my client ever received. It never said that was the date of his divorce hearing. It never said that he was to be present and that he would be heard on his divorce case. And yet on May 16th, the day he was told of a contempt hearing the day before, a divorce hearing proceeded without him present. The biggest issue in this case is due process. This case offends me, it offends the judicial system. It shocks my conscience. He has the procedural right to be present, to give notice, and the opportunity to be heard. And the docket is replete with failure of service upon failure of service upon failure of service. The one thing that does exist is this agreed judgment entry, September 13, 2018, signed by Attorney McCarter and Attorney Paul Cray, waiving service. And the magistrate in this matter correctly found that Attorney Paul Cray could not waive service on behalf of my client. He is not, in the rules of civil procedure, a party allowed to accept service. So when we start here, this is where we start with our failure. September 13th, 2018, from here forward, Attorney McCarter only tried to serve my client with a contempt of court. He never served him with a complaint for divorce, ever. <clears throat> and that's what I want this court to focus on. When he's up here addressing you, I want to know the date that he believes my client was served the divorce complaint, the date he believes my client received notice of a hearing on his divorce, and when this court got personal jurisdiction over Staff Sergeant Brian Ward. That is what offends us today. That is what brought us here today. We have appealed this case now twice. It went back to be determined whether or not it was void. The court did rule in the appellee's favor, stating this was not void. However, I believe, of course, that that is incorrect. My client did not participate meaningfully in this matter. The things he did file were a request to appear by phone, a continuance, just things that did not what actually was he requesting to, to continue? I'm sorry, could you repeat? What was he requesting to continue when he filed a motion to continue? The hearing on the motion for contempt of court. Which was what date? 
Uh, I would have to double trial date or, or a separate date? It was a separate date. It was not the May 16th date. That date that, was he, the, that was the same date he was asking to appear by telephone that same event. That date he was asking to appear by phone for his contempt of court date. Yes. He never knew of a hearing on his divorce complaint. There is nothing in the record that would ever indicate that he did, was aware, waived service, appeared, or substantially participated in this case. So, what we're here today to determine is whether or not service of process was made under the civil rules, whether or not due process was followed. And I, again, I'm asking this court, this shocks my conscience. I think it follows right under the rules of due process and substantive due process and procedural due process that this never should have gotten this far. There should have never been a judgment entry against him. Nobody should have ever asked to hold him in contempt of court. And I do understand he was not held in contempt. He couldn't be. But it, it was just the matter that we're here today, three years later, four years later, still arguing whether or not my client had the notice and opportunity to be heard. Which we knew that he filed a complaint in this case, did he not? He filed a complaint in a different case number. He knew there was a divorce case pending. That case number was dismissed. Did he know there was a divorce case of this matter pending? His, yes. Yes, and he knew he was aware of that. Yes. His counsel was aware and signed a waiver. Now you say that's not sufficient, sufficient, but there was a waiver signed. By his counsel, yes. He had then retained a separate counsel to participate in this matter, did he not? Yes, his counsel was there. And he participated pro se. I'm going to not say he participated. He filed motions? Yes. And that's not participation? He did not file anything substantive. He filed a motion that knew there was a case proceeding. He knew there was a case whether, you know, again, a contempt of court was pending against him. He was told his life, liberty, and all of that was in jeopardy and that he could be put in jail. He did know that. He knew there was a divorce case pending. He knew that he had filed one. Okay, so he knew one was pending. Yes, his, which does not exist today. He knew there was some dates pending and there was a case going on. Yes. You call him staff sergeant? Yes. When he was serving in this particular case when he was overseas, was he serving in the military? He was serving as a subcontractor. So he was not in the military. He had been a staff sergeant in the past? Or what capacity was he a staff sergeant? So he is a staff sergeant in the United States Air Force. And once he finished with his Air Force duties, he was a subcontractor, which was filed in this matter. It is part of the record. So when active duty ended, was he in reserves or anything? That's not in the record. I'm unaware. Okay. But again, my biggest argument here is whether or not he's a subcontractor under the military law. He's not a subhuman under the United States law, under the Ohio laws, and he deserved due process and the right to be heard. And I don't believe that occurred for him, whether or not he's a subcontractor, a civilian, or any other human being. He did not get his due process rights. If there are no further questions, that is actually all I have for you. Thank you very much. You will have your full five minutes. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court, your honors. So I appreciate my esteemed counsel, your discussion of staff sergeant for if he was military, certainly appreciate that and welcome to service. I mean, it's important for that. My concern and my concern, just so this court's aware, I know you guys may not have been, your honors may not have been part of this a couple years ago. My concern was the very first time was in the oral argument. It was continuously used as staff sergeant or as if he should have been afforded the Sailors and Soldiers Relief Act in this particular case. And so if he's military, and we still don't know that, haven't seen it. And I guess my concern is, is the argument still is being continued to be made in appellant's argument that he should have been afforded Sailors and Soldiers Relief Act. And it sounds like here that he was not part of the military at that time. So that trial court make any findings regarding this and the decisions being appealed from whether he was or was not Sailors and Soldiers Relief Act applied to this? It wasn't raised at the trial court level. It was raised in the briefs. I'd go back and read the briefs. It was raised in there in the motion, the most recent motion it was raised. Oh, and I don't believe it was raised by the trial court partly because there was no, there was nothing in the record at all indicating that he was active military 
at, at any point? Well, the trial court doesn't find that. The trial court, at no point, and I read their decision, said I find nothing in the record that establishes this gentleman that the military, therefore I'm not going to rule on this. As I read the decision, is that fair? That's fair, yes. That's fair. But what I would say is this, uh, and <clears throat> this court was very specific when it sent it back to the trial court on um, whether this was supposed to be, whether this case is to be void for failure of, uh, or voidable due to uh, service on him, on Mr. Ward. If he wanted to raise the Sailors and Soldiers Relief Act, that should have been raised the first time coming before this court for this court to be able to send it back to the court and say, hey court, hey trial court, what we would like you to do, it doesn't ever appear that you ruled on the Sailors and Soldiers Relief Act. Um, we would like you to do that. But it was never raised the first time around. And at this point, that can't be raised because this court was very specific on what the trial court needed to determine. And that's what the court focused on, was that it's not a, uh, it was not a judgment that's void out of issue. And, and so, I guess, again, to me, uh, Ms. Kulik talks about that her client knew that his divorce was pending at one point and dismissed. It wasn't dismissed. It was never dismissed. That case was never dismissed. That case was consolidated into the very case that we're here right now. The court saw both cases pending, consolidated, and gave a very specific order to uh, to. Ms. Vitek, which was to answer or to treat that as a counterclaim and said, you have so many days in which to file an answer based on Mr. Ward's counterclaim in this case. And then he was, there was a lot of work that was done in this case. Was intimately involved in this case, both through his attorney and through his own filings. In fact, there was a filing the day before trial that is still asking, can I do this electronically? I need to quash some information here. That was all done. He filed that the day before. He knew that this case was pending. And, and in the meantime, had filed numerous pleas through the second attorney. Requests for discovery, supplemental requests, uh, uh, leave to have more than 40 interrogatories. And then once that attorney asked to withdraw and was allowed to withdraw, Mr. Vitek filed a couple more uh, motions. And, and so I know that uh, in his brief, in the appellant's brief, it talks one case, I think it's Qualic or uh, Q U L I O C O um, in there. That is, in, in that particular case that came out of, out of uh, the 9th District here, uh, the court said, listen, if our student has out of the 10th District down in Columbus, said that if if someone just calls the clerk of courts and said, and, hey, can you send us a letter? So they sent a letter, Ms. Walk sent a letter. Hey, I'm looking for all these pleadings, all this information. Clerk, can you send that back to me? That court said that that's not intimately involved in the divorce case to, to, to say that you're part of this case, that you can't say you're not part of this case. She didn't ask the court to do anything, never made an appearance, never had an attorney make, make an appearance in that particular case. Ultimately, in that case, the 10th District found that, that, the, that there was service on the husband in that case through publication of service. So they didn't even send it back and say, hey, you don't have any service in this case and we're just going to throw this case out. They ultimately said you had service by service by publication. Um, Your Honor, and Ms. Qualk is right, this case has been going on since summer of 2018. Summer 2018, case is over, summer 2019. And Mr. Ward filed 17 months later his, uh, his 60B motion that made its way through the appeals court the first time, through this court the first time, and sent it back on a specific issue. And there isn't anything that he has brought up in his, uh, his brief that would indicate that there was no service or he didn't have any idea that this case was going on. How did you have service on this case? I'm so sorry. How did your client have service on Mr. Ward in this case? In terms of service, so service, when the court moved, consolidated the cases, that put the two cases together. And 
the court now has uh, jurisdiction over it because it's his own case, his own filing. The court has service over him to be able to include him in that case. And he, they, he, Mr. Ward knew about that because not only did his own two counsels he had file motions in the new case number, he also filed motions in the same case number. So, and he was a part of the case at that point. Was there anything where counsel waived served in this case in the record? Uh, in the record, the, the, the waiver was just um, Mr., uh, I believe it was Mr. Craig at the time, it was the attorney at the time. He signed it, it wasn't uh, Mr. Ward signed. There was nothing on the paper that Mr. Ward signed, but Mr. Craig signed it um, at that point. And this was, while Mr. Craig was still attorney of record, from the consolidated case, because Mr. Cray had originally filed, his first counsel had originally filed a divorce on behalf of Mr. Ward. No answer was ever filed with a counterclaim in this case on behalf, or the claim of the divorce case on behalf of Mr. Ward? No count, I don't believe a, a, an answer was filed at that point. Correct. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I have anything more other than to just try to answer any questions that we've been, my office has been a part of this case ever since Beginning, um, and a lot of things have taken place, and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, uh, that your honors have in this matter. Any questions? There are none. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Counsel, you have five minutes. Thank you, your honors. I just wanted to address a few things that Attorney McCarter brought up. Personal jurisdiction. It can be raised at any time. It did not need to be in a 60B. It did not need to be within one year. So we are, we're not even talking about the 60B anymore. We're past that. This is a personal jurisdiction issue. The fact that this case was consolidated with the case my client had filed, again, that does not automatically grant service to anybody. I have not found a rule in the state of Ohio that allows that to waive service. Uh, and also, there was no proof that the consolidated judgment entry stating your case was consolidated was ever sent to my client. That's not in the record. Now, Attorney McCarter brought up, I, again, I'm just like him, I don't know if I pronounce it right, the QUICO case. That is in my brief, uh, along with the Mary Q case. And both cases talk about personal jurisdiction. Both cases talk about whether or not somebody participated enough to have personal jurisdiction. In Maryview, they found that a motion for leave to plead was not substantive enough. Here, we don't even have a motion for leave to plead. We did, he never asked for leave to plead an answer. He never pled an answer. 12B6 defenses were never raised. None of that occurred. As uh, Attorney McCarter stated, the things here were limited to discovery and to trying to appear by phone for this contempt case. I feel very strongly that there's nothing in this record that shows that my client had personal, that this court had personal jurisdiction over my client. Is this fine a complaint waiving personal jurisdiction in the court? In his complaint? Yeah, he, he filed a divorce complaint. Wouldn't that be waiver of personal jurisdiction? Would, why would he be fine in a complaint if somewhere he that doesn't have personal jurisdiction? Wouldn't that confer personal jurisdiction on the court just him filing that way, that complaint here? Only in his complaint number. Now, when that was consolidated with this, he still had no service of this complaint. His complaint surely existed, but that case did not proceed forward. And again, he was never served any consolidation. He was never told what happened to his complaint. Uh, he, you know, a complaint was filed. That complaint just was consolidated with this complaint. There was nothing ever that waived service, that received service, that answers were filed. You know, from his perspective, he filed the complaint that went nowhere. Again, from here on out, we just had failures. And, and counsel suggested that you said the complaint had been dismissed. You're not saying the complaint had been dismissed. It was. It was consolidated. And, and as far as your client, it was consolidated. It was never dismissed in any way. Yeah, as far, as far as I'm aware, it was consolidated. But again, that judgment entry never reached my client. That judgment entry never went anywhere. This case, again, like I just want to reiterate, we can't say anywhere where that notice of consolidation was sent to my client, where a complaint for divorce was sent to my client or a notice of hearing on a divorce complaint was sent to my client, or my client signed a waiver of service, or my client substantially participated. That's never going to be in this record. It's never going to exist. And this court should determine that this entry was void. I know we talked a little bit about the Military Act and things of that nature, and again, that's why I addressed that when I walked into this room. It's not in any pleadings, because there were no substantive pleadings. 
Well, so, the grade that the Court of Appeals level in the first 60B that was considered by the Court of Appeals. It, yeah, it was finally raised there when we came up here. And again, like I said, when I rewatched the oral argument, it was, it was the largest part of the oral argument, was whether or not I could call my client by his title. And again, that for me doesn't give personal jurisdiction to anybody, whether or not he's a staff sergeant, whether or not he's a United States citizen. He is, he is a staff sergeant, but all of this does not have anything to do with procedural due process, substantive due process, and that's what this whole brief is about. So once we get past the due process substantive thing, whether or not this shocks the conscience, we go into procedural, whether he had notice and a right to be heard, and the law says it still must be implemented in a fair manner. And we're all here trying to argue and figure out how we can make this fair, how we can make it seem that he was served, how we can make it seem that everything went okay for him. And none of this was fair for him. None of this has been fair for him for the start. What would be fair is if he got notice and an opportunity to be heard and if he could participate in his divorce case. So that's all I would really like this court to focus on. That's what I would love for a final ruling on on this matter. And I know that I've argued vehemently here. I mean, if Blame, blame my head, not my heart. I really believe in this case. I really believe in my client. And I really hope that this court files that this judgment was void. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Um, the clerk of courts will mail a copy of that decision to each of you on the day that it is released. And the opinions will also be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you.